Now, uh, would you please help us welcome our speaker for the evening, uh, Buddy C. from the Washington Park Group in Cranston, Rhode Island. Hi, I'm Buddy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Buddy. Uh, I am a member of the Washington Park Group. That was my first group I walked, uh, that I joined. Um, my sober date is February 24th, 1999. It's also my daughter, my middle daughter, middle child, oldest daughter, Socorro's birthday, and uh, no coincidences. And uh, my Big Book Step Study group that I belong to for 19 years is the Design for Living Big Book Step Study group, group in uh, Attleboro on Wednesday nights. Um, um, so, yeah, uh, Step 12 says, um, you know, before I go too far, welcome to the Guys, it's your first time here, or, you know. Um, step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening, as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message. I was just talking to a friend about that before the meeting. What's this message? Again, buddy. Having had a spiritual awakening, as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message. The message that I'm supposed to carry is how I had a flipping spiritual experience. Not my mess. Is there anybody in here that don't know how to drink or get high? I can get, I'll, I'll go over that briefly to qualify. Um, but, you know, I, I've been taught that um, I, uh, what it used to be like uh, would happen than what it's like today. That it's supposed to be a spiritual odyssey through life. What it used to be like, I'm one of eight Irish Catholic <laughs> Union Democrats brought up on Colfax Street in South Providence. I went to St. Michael's School, uh, and, and I played sports and hung around as a kid and swam in the pool at the Southside Boys Club. And uh, I was the youngest of the four boys. Um, I lived on uh, Colfax Street, is one street over from Thurber's Avenue, um, right across the street from where I lived was an A&P at the time and, and a Woolworths and, you know, it was good. You know what I mean? It was, you know, it was, you know I did, everybody in that neighborhood was pretty much poor. You know what I mean? So I never feel, felt out of place or nothing like that. Um, uh, it, you know, times were different than they are now. I'm 67. So, that, you know, I played a lot of sports. That's what I did. And went to the boys club. And uh, around the... Around the uh, mid 60s, they started having some uh, race um, problems. And uh, there wasn't any, I wasn't brought up like that, thank God. Um, and, uh, but at any rate, my parents sent me uh, to Pawtucket uh, to get away, because I was like 12 at the time. And uh, uh, my brothers, they were all older, hanging up on the corner. But again, they didn't have no racial problems either. They, you know, but whatever. So I went to Pawtucket when I was 12, and that was where I picked up my first drink. And, and I, they sent me there because they, they were my godparents, and they have uh, two boys. My cousin Jimmy was two years older. My cousin Kevin was the same age as me. And then my other cousin, uh, Ray, he, went, he used to go there too in the summer. Not for the whole summer like I did, but at any rate, like I've heard around in AA many times, you know, I drank. Uh, you know, I got drunk, liked it grew up and couldn't wait to do it again. And uh, fast forward 50 something years later, I'm standing at the podium of an AA meeting. Um, my, my cousin, uh, Jimmy, who, um, you know, the older one, he put a rope around his neck on his 30th birthday and was swinging from a tree outside the Charles Gate home there on, you know, off on North Main Street, because he couldn't drink no more. He unsuccessfully tried to take his life driving his car like a buck into a Jersey barrier down by uh, School Street in Pawtucket. And uh, he lost half of his stomach. So the year that he took his life, he had been hospitalized 25 times to be pumped out. And, uh, and so like in 19, uh, yeah, 19, whatever, 1999, I was 43 and uh, I know today God's grace led me in these halls. I didn't say, y'all, let me go to AA. 
Um, my oldest brother, Mike, he died up on Broad Street at 29, drunk driving. And uh, I remember taking him to uh, a, hot, a detox hospital up in uh, Worcester. They used to call, it was called Doctor's Hospital at the time. It's like ad care or something now, I think. But, um, and you know, he, he had that horrible um, alcoholic life. Um, he, he had like serious jackpots. He had his last rights read to him a few times before he died. He, he was, it was hardcore and it was like heartbreaking and caused a lot of turmoil like at home, you know what I mean? And uh, so, um, yeah, so he, he, uh, he died and uh, he had two children at the time. My niece, Mike, uh, my niece Michelle and her brother Mike Jr. And uh, she was 10 and he was 12. And uh, at any rate, I, even though he was an alcoholic, my conception of an alcoholic, another thing that kept me out of here until I was 43 and uh, basically walked in here, a 43-year-old, uh, a 10-year-old boy emotionally in a 43-year-old body, what kept me out of here for so long um, was, you know, my conception of an alcoholic was the one I used to walk by up on Broad Street as a kid. You know, the textbook one, the trench coat and stuff like that, the winos, there was a lot of them in South Providence back when I was, a lot of them. And, uh, and the other kind was people like my brother. You know what I mean? That when they drank, they, you know, horror stories, you know, and uh, bad ones. And I'm neither one of them. You know, I work on the railroad. <coughs> um, I provide best I can for, uh, for my three beautiful eye reeking kids. And, um, and that was that. And, but, you know, when God put Louie in my path to take me to a meeting, I went to a, a Wednesday night meeting downtown uh, St. Francis Chapel. It was a men's 12 and 12 uh, meeting, and uh, they, were, they were all professionals. They were like lawyers, and, you know, they all had suit, nice suits on and jewelry and, you know, like alligator shoes. I wanted to be there like I wanted to have a root canal. You know, I was pretty pissed at Louie that he even brought me there because he knows I don't like people like that. You know what I mean? Because I had that south side chip on my shoulder. But at any rate, the next night I went to a meeting. That was on a Thursday. I don't remember, so it didn't leave an impression. The third night I went to a meeting, um, the Paddle Group. It used to be in Knightsville at uh, St. Anne's. And I saw a lot of guys. That was a big meeting back then. Over 100 people every, every Friday night. Like a show and tell meeting, I guess. It's a speaker meeting, but it was the place to go. And there, there was like a half a dozen guys in the far corner. As soon as I walked in, they were looking at me. And, you know what I mean? They were going like this. I knew they were talking about me. I, you know what I mean? I didn't, you know, I couldn't read their minds, but it was, it was a no-brainer. And then one of them come up to me and he said, Hey, is your last name Conan? And I said, Yeah. He said, Geez, you look just like your brother Mike. And I, and I did. There was six years difference between him and I, but we looked like identical twins. And uh, <clears throat> they welcomed me. And, um, and then after, you know, they, after the end of the meeting, they did the chips and they had pretty much men sitting on the outside chair all the way up on one side and woman all the way on the other side. And I got my chip and I walked out and like every guy stuck out their hand. You know what I mean? And you, I could see it was genuine. And, uh, and that started for me, you know. Two days later, I went to another meeting and I saw a guy from, from South Providence where I grew up, Andy B. He's still a member now of the paddle. And he was a ball player. He was six, he's six foot six. He was a good ball player. And, uh, you know, he used to be a bookie back in the day. And, you know, he's just like, you know, I said, I can't bullshit this guy. Let me grab him. And I did. And, uh, and that started my journey in AA. You know, I'm, I'm what I consider, what I believe my experience, I'm a minority. I was told by very good people with very good intentions, five suggestions. Ask God in the morning, of, a God of my understanding in the morning for help to stay away from a drink or a drug just for today. At night, if I had success with that, get on my knees and thank that God for a day of sobriety. And the other three suggestions are join a group, get a sponsor, and be active in AA. And I did all of those things. 
but unfortunately that's not the program of AA. That's suggestions by people, some of them been, could say around 30, 40 years, some of them, you know what I mean? <clears throat> but for me, I never missed a, meet, a meeting for four years straight. I did 1990, I figured out all by myself, I didn't have to ask my sponsor. I said, wow, this, this, you know, this is all right. And uh, I did a 90 and 90 again. And I did it for four years, pretty much. Um, then if, the day after my four year anniversary, I had to go in for cancer surgery. And uh, I, I definitely would have been dead if I wasn't sober. Cause you know, I don't know about you when you're out there, but when I'm out there, I don't have insurance and I ain't going to no doctors. For, you know what I mean? It was just they found it through blood work. And at any rate, so I go and have this uh, surgery. Thank God. And but for the grace of God, I've been in remission total like zero after that for whatever, 18, 19 years now. And, uh, and then four and a half years sober. They used to call me the mayor because um, I, have, I have two children. Uh, Roberta's 34. My youngest is 34. Um, just gave me two wicked cute twins, John and Julie. There, there'll be two in January, uh, Christmas. I was with them today, actually. But anyway, and then my daughter Socorro, she's giving me an awesome grandson, Asmar Abdullah, real good ball player with Hendrick Kane. You know what I mean? Great, great kid. And uh, and my son, Junior, he gave me his, you know, his. Daughter, my oldest one, she's 23. Ashley, she's a nurse on our end. Nicholas, his son, is a uh, he's a student at URI, and he had a baby mama down in Florida after he got divorced. And that my son, grandson Godric is down there. And uh, a senior moment. Yeah. Um, but. Oh yeah, my son, he's one of us. And when I got sober, I got sober on a street called Ida Street. That's off of Hartford Avenue, about two, one or two streets up from the projects. And uh, my son was living in a basement across the street and he had a real bad addiction at the time. And I used to literally watch him crawl out of the basement window in the morning and uh, you know, he'd be calling me out in the street to fight and stuff. He's a big kid and, you know, it, it, it was just a mess. We didn't have a good relationship at all. And I'm going to AA meetings like every day down in Oneyville and uh, he don't want to hear it. And uh, so whenever I went to meetings, I would put my hand out to young guys. And I pretty much still do that today. Like I consider Joe, anybody that's young, like 20 years younger than me, they're, they're like your kids, or, you know, like my kids. <laughs> My kids, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're age, so I put my hand out to them. So that's how I got the nickname, the mayor of AA, because I went to everything the AA had to offer my first four years before I got to cancer. I went to all the dances. I went on the boat thing to Block Island. I was very active in AA, and I, and I liked it, because not only did my life get better, my kids' life got better. I ended up getting a job at a university that enabled me to hand out basketballs, which I really didn't have to do. The students did it. They worked. I was like their boss. I, I got paid to watch my daughter practice and play four years college basketball at Johnson & Wales on the shipyard. So my, my life was getting good. Um, so I loved AA for the three and a half years and that's all I did was those suggestions, okay? And at four and a half years sober, my daughter-in-law calls me up. We got my son on the railroad now and uh, so he's making decent money. And my daughter-in-law calls me up and she said, Bud, Junior took the money, me and the kids don't have anything. The, you know, the rent's due, we don't have no food. Blah, blah. I said, all right, honey. So my son shows up at the mayor's house a couple of days later after his run. I was living in Knightsville at the time. Uh, I was in a relationship at the time. Anyway, he comes over to my house and I had a knock on the door. I walked downstairs on the second floor. I walked downstairs and I see it's my son. And I'm not proud to say this. I don't even like how I say it, but this is exactly how I said it to him. And I think he wants me to never forget it. And I look, I see it's my son and I say, you piece of shit. And I shut the door. And that's not the dad that I wanted to be. Total, total hypocrite, phony, full of crap. 
I got high with my son. Mm. Smoked weed with him and his friends and let him drink, thinking I was doing the right thing. You know what I mean? Now, you know, a couple of years later, he's got a serious addiction and I'm in AA and I'm the mayor of AA. Mm. And you know, that's what, that's what I had to offer my firstborn. They say, you know, we come in here, you don't want to be two different people. You know, you're one guy in AA or one woman in AA, then you go home and you're kicking the dog. Mm. And that's way worse than kicking the dog it was for me. So that night I definitely couldn't go to sleep. I didn't know why I did that. I didn't know why I reacted like that. And I basically wanted to take my life again, mm. four and a half years sober. And a very short time after that, it's not important, um, but God put this little angel in my path. I think you remember this woman, Peg, she moved from Boston to Edgewood. And uh, she comes, so she belonged to the same group, Washington Park. So she comes up to me one day before the meeting. She said, oh, but I went to a lovely meeting last weekend with my daughter. I was visiting her in Massachusetts. And, uh, and uh, she told me that they have one. They started down the Cape in 79. And they have one Wednesday nights in Annabelle. Would you like to go? That's my home group now. And I said, yeah, sure, Peg. I figured she wanted me to drive and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we go to this meeting, and it's a big book step study meeting. They announced before the meeting, if you haven't done these steps the way they are laid out with the big book step study sponsor from one of these type of big book step study meetings, we ask that you just listen. It's not to embarrass anyone or we just feel if you're talking about the problem you can't possibly be talking about the solution we'd be more than have, happy to talk to you after the meeting or one of the group members and after that meeting I had no problem with that however when I was a year and a half sober I had heard about these meetings there used to be a meeting up Smith Hill at St. Patrick's on Friday nights called Last Call because the meeting went all it went for hours so I started at 10 went for like two and three in the morning sometimes <laughs> You know, people would just walk in and they'd, they'd keep it open. At any rate, this guy's telling me uh, from Massachusetts, he used to come there, I don't know why, he had friends there, I guess, from another group. But anyway, he says, yeah, buddy, I went to an interesting meeting this week. I said, oh yeah, what's, what's that? He said, well, it was a men's uh, meeting, a big book meeting, uh, like, I think they called it a study, and uh, only certain men could speak, and you had to get one of them to be your sponsor. And I said, what? You can't speak. You gotta get one of them to be a sponsor. F them freaks. The arrogance of this alcoholic a year and a half sober. I, you know, I don't need that. I'm, I'm in an AWOL, which, whatever, at the time, and I got all the answers. And I said, no. Three and a half years, three years later, I'm four and a half years sober. God, of my understanding, in his never ending grace and mercy, puts this little angel in my path to take me to the same exact meeting that I threw under the bus big time three years earlier. And I went there and I heard stuff that I had never heard before. There was a kid there actually from um, Ireland. He was like 26, this kid Dara. And, he, and they were on that chapter, there is a solution. And uh, he says, yes, today I'm a man, I'm doing fox about myself. And I found this solution. And I'm like, you know, and the rest of that paragraph says something like, uh, yeah, he found, man, probably on to a fax about himself and has found the solution, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours, few short hours, and until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as soon as I left that meeting, I couldn't tell you one word I heard in there. Because my dumpster, this thing on my neck, I used to call, was full. But I knew what I heard was the real deal. And I had never heard it before in Rhode Island on a consistent basis that I heard it that night. The only people that were allowed to speak had gone through the, through the process. And I left there with a gigantic resentment against the whole state of Rhode Island. And the longer, the longer you were sober, the more pissed off I was at you. I was mental, like really. I was, I was ripped. I was ripped, and uh, so like I said, that's still my home group, and I go every Saturday morning, I also go to this meeting in Norton, I, I, you know, and I've just come back to speaker meetings, because um, after I've gone through the process, I've seen that it's the real deal. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a singular program of recovery. This right here tonight is lovely, but it's fellowship. That it's fellowship, you know what I mean? 
the program, um, it says, and the first step, uh, in page 30, and if I say the page, it ain't to impress nobody, because uh, believe me, I know um, that my sobriety is contingent on my spiritual condition one day at a time. But it says on page 30 near the bottom, um, and it, it, it didn't click until I was pretty much in the middle of my fourth step at least, but it says, um, alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period of time, we get worse, never better. And I said like, damn, then I, I, then I knew why I called my son a piece of shit. Mm. <clears throat> Because I have a threefold illness. When I went to Dr. Stein for my cancer, he says, oh, come on in, buddy. After the test, he calls me in, and I go there with the girl, with the girl I was with at the time. And, hey, buddy, we got bad news, we got good news. The bad news is you got cancer, the good news is we're gonna take care of you. We're gonna do this, 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 this. I said, okay, all right. And I really, I, you know, I didn't have a lot of fear about it. Like between when I was told, and I didn't go to meetings, I didn't tell anybody, I didn't, you know, I just said, all right, you know, because I've always been like that. You know, everything happens for a reason. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's will by mistake. I've always believed that way before I got to AA. And um, so I did everything they told me because I had this illness that kills people, disease. But with alcoholism, it's a threefold illness, if, in case you've never heard. It's physical mental, emotional, and spiritual. Mm. For four and a half years, now I got on my knees in the morning and asked God to stay away from a drink or a drug, and I thanked him at night. But during the rest of the day, step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, that was not existent. It was only in the morning and at night. There was no conscious relationship with God in my understanding. So I was still living like I used to live, not, yeah, you know what I mean? I wasn't doing quite the crazy illegal things that I did then, but I was still not who I wanted to be. I was not the dad who I wanted to be. I was not the grandfather I wanted to be, the brother, you know what I mean, the significant other. And uh, <clears throat> so I knew, I know today from, you know, like I said, I was very far into my fourth step at that time. For four and a half years, I addressed one component of my three component illness. I didn't go to meetings and I didn't drink or drug. So I addressed the physical component. And like I said, yeah, I asked them for help in the morning and thanked them at night, but that's really not what they're talking about. I, it works for the minority of people. My experience, I'm a minority. Most people sitting in this room tonight are the majority. They need a real solution to a serious friggin' illness. And it ain't by sitting on your ass going to, you know, that's good. And it works for people. If it works for you, if you've been doing that for sitting here for 20 years, God bless you. That's, that's good. But for an alcoholic of my type, in my experience, most alcoholics, you have to go do, do the program. So when I'm going through it, I realize that I called them a piece of shit because of fear. Hmm. I react to fear, usually not too good. It comes out of me sideways. My experience, it comes out of most people sideways. In this case, it came out as verbal abuse. You know what I mean? When I was younger, it may have come out physical confrontations, whatever. I don't, it can't, all I know is it's bad. But I didn't know that's why I called him that. I was really afraid of standing over him at Russell Boyle's funeral parlor. Because not only did, did he have a crack addiction at the time, he was also 350, 400 pounds now. Poor kid, he's close to like 500. You know, he's on the, he's on the, the, the maintenance program, the liquid, you know, methadone. And, you know, there's, there's hope for him on that. So I don't, I don't have no problem with that. There's, there's hope. But um, my father died of a massive at 48. And my brother, one of my brothers, my brother Kenny died at 54. So it's a bad hot history on the male side of my family. And so I'm afraid that he's gonna die. And the best I had to offer him from sitting in a chair for four and a half years, going to AA meetings, was to call him a piece of shit. Mm. Now I didn't know then, but I know today, you can put your butt in a chair in a garage, 
for 20, 30 years, it won't make you a flipping car any more than you can put your butt in the chair in a 12-step uh, fellowship without doing the 12 steps and give you any kind of peace and serenity. You know, unless you're in that minority, you, 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 you know, you might be able to. Um, so <clears throat> what happened was, um, you know, I, I read the first three steps with my sponsor very quick. He met me on the border of Rhode Island and Mass at the uh, that Home Depot parking lot there off of 95 in South Alabama, right in the McDonald's parking lot. And we read, you know, we did the readings, the doctor's opinion. He, you know, he told me, you know, look up anything I don't know. Look up words I don't know. He told me to look up words I think I know. I did them both. And, uh, you know, I, I meet with him and we'll do the doctor's opinion, okay? Read uh, more about alcoholism. Uh, step one, did that, met him. Step two, you know, came to believe in a power greater than ourselves could restore us to, to sanity. We came to believe. And that's not mentioned anywhere else in our program of recovery. Restoring us to sanity until you go through a process. And that process is steps three through nine. You don't have to finish nine, but you have to start it. And that's, that's the process. And then right after, on the very first page, after step nine, page 84, it says, when tempted by alcohol, we will recoil from it as from a hot flame. For by this time, we will have been restored to sanity. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's, you know, I didn't come to believe in a God, uh, you know, God of my understanding at step two. Or step three, I, I found the God of my understanding the same way as Bill W. and the guys who wrote this book. They say it clearly on page 55 in the chapter we agnostics. They say, um, in the last analysis, it is only there where he may be found, period. Then it says it was so with us. Thank God. Because they're saying they didn't write the book on finding God, but some of these men out of the first 82, 100, whatever you want, came from very religious backgrounds. One of them, you know, was the son of a minister and, you know, all, the, all of this stuff. So I looked up the word analysis because an alcoholic, we want the easiest soft way. Oh, yeah, analysis. I know that's like CSI, that TV show, you know, <laughs> through the fine tooth comb, all of that. <clears throat> Thank God I looked it up. And not verbatim, but could, could be close. There's more than one description, like for a lot of words, but how it's used in, in our text is an analysis, the taking of a whole, in this case it was Buddy, the taking of a whole, dividing it into its many parts to find their nature. Yeah. It's missing one word from step five, admitted to God, to ourself, and to another human being, the exact each of our wrongs. That's where they found their God, I got goosebumps. And that's where I have, you know, I went to St. Michael's school, my father's sister was a nun, she was a mother superior nun, and they travel in packs. She had like four bodyguards or whatever. You know what I mean? So every holiday, there was a whole bunch of them in my house. And, you know, I, I never had a problem with God. I always believed in God as a kid. You know what I mean? That's where, like, the beginning of my spiritual odyssey, I was brought up to believe in God. And I did. I didn't blame him when me and my mom walked in on my dad, dead of a heart attack on the floor at uh, 48. She left, he left my mom with eight, eight of us. Eight. Um, eight of us, seven of us were Irish twins, you know what I mean? Boom, 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 right after another. Still in the house, you know? And, uh, but I was an agnostic, which means uh, you believe in God, just like it says in the book. Um, you believe in him, but you're on the fence. How they describe it in, in our literature. What with warring individuals, that's kids killing each other every night, you know, from Chad and Camp Street or whatever. You know, we're all over the country. Warring individuals, warring theological systems, that's us and, you know, ISIS, whatever, and uh, inexplicable calamity. However, so we look at these things and, well, how can it be a God if he's letting all this bad stuff happen? It says, however, that, but when it chanted, however, like on a solid night then, we look at awe and wonder, and I always used to go, 
wow, <laughs> who made all of this? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, really, like, you know, that's the way it was for me, spiritually. You're like, wow, look at that, who made all of this? <laughs> and uh, it says, however, that feeling of awe and wonder is fleeting and soon lost. We forget about it. So we, we even though on the fence, suppose they're not sick, we tend to lean towards the negative, my experience, or I did anyway. Shouldn't say we, but I, I did. And <clears throat> so now um, I know that, you know, an ag the agnostic I was, I believed in God for some crazy reason. I believed that if I asked him in the morning for help and thanked him at night, I'd stay clean and sober, which I did. But I did not believe that he could help me with my selfishness, my dishonesty, my jealousy, my lust. You know, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't have a personal relationship with God. And I thought people who said that they did and were born again and all the things like that, I thought they were full of shit. But it's good that they're happy and, you know, they live a good life. But, you know, I never bought any of that stuff. Because um, I'm an alcoholic, or, you know, thick-headed. Um, However, um, the God I have today, it is, he is the most central, important fact of my life today. He's entered my heart and in my life in a way which is, like it says, indeed miraculous. I had, you know, when I did my fourth step, and there's so many, I was talking to Joe before the meeting, there's so much erroneous information in AA. You know what I mean? So, so much. And I'm not throwing AA into the bus. I go to AA. I went to a meeting today and I, I go in Attleboro. That's where I live now, at the Cameron Building. A discussion, great, great meeting. But all I'm saying is that there, were, there was a lot of erroneous information in there. And then after I did this process and I'm like, Throwing the, throwing the process around. Hey, buddy, uh, it's, uh, it's attraction, not promotion. Okay. However, but I can sit and listen to just keep coming, the miracle will happen. And I would say, yeah, my experience is you've got a good a friggin' chance of waiting for a miracle to happen sitting in McDonald's parking lot mm -hmm. as you do sitting in a chair in here. Mm -hmm. That word's thrown around pretty lightly, miracle. Mm. And... Uh, you know, and things like that. So I used to pound it, you know, pretty hard. And it, to say, yeah, buddy, you know, if that big world works for you, fine. But we have no monopoly on God. I said, yeah, I know. I said, I know where it says that too, do you? Nobody where. Yeah. Well, actually, it says it in step 12 on the bottom of 95. It says, we have no monopoly on God. We merely have an approach, singular again. They had one approach that worked for them. Period. If your prospect does not want to go with your, the program of AA, he wants to try some other method, he says we should wish him well and remain friends. And that happened to me. I've had just about every experience that, 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 that the 12 step talks about. And he says, hey buddy, can I ask you a question? No, he had a sponsor. If somebody has a sponsor, he said, you can keep your sponsor as long as we don't get into a pissing contest. If you want, you know, I'll take people through the steps. Because Bill W. said what a sponsor is in 1952 in the grapevine. You can look it up. A sponsor, because that word is not in the big book, a sponsor is a person who assumes responsibility for another person's spiritual development, semicolon, continuous thought, a person who takes another person through a, and I'll get a little, whatever you want to call it, in meetings that are not big book, through a period of instruction, not a life coach. No, it's not a life coach. Where that came from, I actually, I, uh, I can't, you know, what, what, what happened? So I was on a tier last week at my home group. Because I'm, I'm tired of going to funerals for 30 year olds. And uh, I kind of lit it up a little bit. And uh, some received this, some didn't. I didn't really care. But in our literature, in the big book, in the second forward, it says from 1935, when AA was started, till 1955, 50% of the people who came to AA 
got and stayed and died sober. Another 25%, many of them after relapsing, coming back, doing the work, many of them also stayed sober. So let's say 1% of them, 25, I don't care. 51%. And people say, well, yeah, but there wasn't a lot of people then. Well, uh, yes, there was. There was 200,000. That's, that's, that's a decent, you know what I mean? And uh, so I said, well, what happened today? How come it's changed? How come 50% of the people that come in here don't stay? Mm. Into the program. <coughs> they do Joe's. Joe's program, I got 35 years. Good, go make a freaking commercial. Can you help an alcoholic? <laughs> if you can't, that's okay. But don't try throwing me under the bus. Mm-hmm. Or don't try throwing this meeting under the bus. Because I came here last week, I came once before, and I came last week, and it was his anniversary. And I've been telling everybody all week, uh, especially like my niece who's hardcore, Farrah, maybe some of you guys know, I don't know, an addict, you know what I mean? I said, oh, Farrah, honey, you gotta go to this meeting and say, man, too, there's a lot of people your age, and you know, the, the, the only people allowed to speak, I think, are people have experience with the, the, the process, and you know, and a lot of them seem to be, they're happy being there, and they go out after for fellowship, and you know, I was really impressed. I, you know, I was very, very impressed. I was very happy because, like I said, you know, yeah, 107,000 people died this year on opiates, and 150,000 died from alcohol this year. Who keeps track of that stuff? I don't know, but still, it's a lot of people, right? If that program, you know, say, if it could help me, it could help anybody, well, you know, I don't know the life you had. That's why they say, you just keep coming. There's a wrench for every nut that walks through that door. The people will laugh. <laughs> well, that's pretty pitiful to me. Mm-hmm. The program is supposed to be any alky or addict who walks through that door, we're all supposed to be friggin' adjustable wrenches that can fit anybody that walks through that door. And what happened with the 50% till nine, till, till today, which is, let's say 10%, I've heard, but I don't believe it's that. In 1953, Bill W. wasn't going to meetings. So at the General Service Office in New York, they said, hey, Bill's not going to meetings. We gotta do, you know, we gotta do something. What are we gonna do? Well, let's, why don't we start a meeting here? That meeting is still going on to this day, Fridays at noon, at the General Service Office in New York. And they said, let's change the format. Up until 1953, the only meetings in the world were speaker meetings. The only people allowed to speak at those meetings, guess who they were? Hmm. People who had recovered from alcoholism through the 12 steps as they laid out in the big book, which is the only textbook in AA, right? Hmm. Let's change the format. We'll, 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 um, because people like go there out of town, they want to go see the, you know, the general service and they go to the meeting, whatever, but there's also, you know, wet drunks from New York City going to that meeting. So they said, let's, let's use the, because um, they're trying to push the literature, money. The, uh, let, let's have it a grapevine, grapevine meeting. We'll give everybody the grapevine book and we'll read it and then we'll, we'll pick a story and then we'll let everybody discuss it. Good intentions. But what happened? Went from 50% recovery rate to what it is today as a result of that, because who's the sickest person in the room? The newcomer. And that's not a slight, I would, I would never do that. I cringe when I hear people talking down to people who would know. And there's a book written, I forget the name, you gotta forgive me, but, and I read it, I read part of it. They showed me, buddy, look at this. This person who showed it to me, they was in a rehab in one socket. And I said, wow, what happened was, would have a war. These, the, 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 these guys that had found the solution and they're carrying the message of how they had a spiritual awakening, right? Now they're going to meetings and they're here in the mess. Now they have, they're getting up there in years of age, like me, they got 20 something years, they're good. So they said, Frig this, I ain't going to hear this bullshit. 
and they started staying home. He said, however, in hindsight, what they did without realizing it was they turned the keys of Alcoholics Anonymous over to the sickest of the sick. And I'm not God. I don't know. I can't prove it, but something had to happen. In Rhode Island, there were no big book steps that this, uh, I don't know if there's one, but there was, the big book wasn't, people didn't know the steps were in the big book. I damn sure didn't know they was in there. I thought there was in the 12 and 12. But the 12 and 12, again, told by my sponsor with very good intentions, I wanted 12 and 12, why don't you start a meeting? I was like four years sober. Start a meeting, 12 and 12. But in the foreword on page 17 of that book, it says, there, however, there's one, a little bit of history of AA, and they say there's still one um, textbook in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. This present volume, meaning the 12 and 12, proposes to broaden and deepen our understanding of the 12 steps as earlier written. In lay terms, what does that mean? That means, <clears throat> Jackie, you want to go, you want to, you want to become a math teacher, right? You have no clue. So you're going to go to college and you're going to go to math 101. One. One. Very good. Now, you're having a family, you need more money. You want to be the department head. You want, so you have to broaden and deepen your knowledge. You're going to get a master's now in math, right? So you're going to go to math 102. Two. <laughs> A one hundred and two, one man's, one man's interpretation of the twelve steps, nothing to do with experience. And that's my experience is everywhere I've been in this country, ninety percent of the, the step meetings, if not ninety five percent, are the twelve and twelve. Mm. You know, you got to you got to learn to walk before you can run. Mm. They say it right there. What are you going to broaden and deepen? You don't know, but. Um, I did say a prayer because, you know, um, before I open my pie hole, because when I don't, you can really tell it's not good. Um, and I'm not here to look good, sound good. You know, I, I'm really not. But this was an opportunity for me to, to tell them how I feel. You know what I mean? Because I have, I have a passion to, to get this message out there. And I'm thrilled that this meeting is, exists. I'm going to tell every young person like I did this week to come to this meeting because I know this is going to save lives. And in the five suggestions, it's going to save a minority of lives. And my experience is, if you're like under 40, ugh. my son's a bright, bright kid. He quit school at classical high school with the, with the highest mark in the school. And he's not coming in here and he's not buying because he's been, he's not buying, just sit down and shut up. He's, you know, just keep coming. Just don't drink. Good people, good intentions. I said the same thing until God had a different path for me. Like it says, and there is a vision for you. We read at the end of every big book step study meeting in Mass anyway. A man cannot transmit something he does not have. And then it'll say, well, keep, you know, God constantly reveals more to us, buddy. Well, yeah, I know it says that. You know what else it says? If your own house is in order. He's not going to reveal nothing to you, my experience, by sitting in a chair. You know what I mean? In the work, I'll just say this. I don't like, I don't like when people say, oh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's really not. Not what's work is if you're living in a sober house, with 12 other guys who are taking your milk and your crackers and your friggin' underwear or whatever. <laughs> That's work, no? That's yeah. work going back to your family, you know, where you head down again. It's work starting your life over again. Mm -hmm. Doing the steps, believe me, it's not work. When I, when, I'll just end by saying this. All the steps did for me, a, a lot. But to wrap it up, I am no longer standing at the train station with a flipping bus ticket. I have a clue today, and I have options. <coughs> That's it. I still go back to old buddy, but I have options today. God, we're blessed. I'm blessed to be here. My neighbors to the right and to the left, if they're not an alky or an addict, when the shit hits the fan in their life, they're running somewhere. They're running to the foxy lady or the foxwoods, or they're running to the coach or the Gucci or the Harley Davidson. 
we get to run to a God of our understanding. I don't know. I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody after the meeting. Um, may the force be with us all. Yeah. <laughs>